previously on Captain Maid's Bridgerton. Said I'm gonna read the first book and I'm actually gonna try and be reading the entire series. So we got a dude with some daddy issues. Penelope, my girl. Don't kidnap her. I still hate Antony though. Okay, am I supposed to care about this couple? She's not like other girls. So I finished that last night and I did immediately move on to Eloise's story. <laughs> This one is about Eloise. You kind of get hints to this one during Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. You get little hints of like Eloise is like obviously writing to someone and she sees this as a potential partner. So the book starts out and you actually meet Marina where if you've seen the TV show is a very different character. First of all, you don't see her at all until the like kind of prologue in this book and you see her for a very brief amount of time. I am going to put a huge trigger warning for the first chapter of this book. So it talks about uh, depression and it also definitely talks about suicide and it is not handled in a good way. Holy crap. I, mm, I'm about like three or four chapters in and so far it's interesting. We'll see how it goes. Apparently Eloise has been writing Sir Philip after Marina dies and they like write each other for a year and he's looking for someone to marry to help with his children with Marina. We'll see how the rest of this book goes but like already we are not off to a great start with this one. So I am about halfway through to Sir Philip with Love. I was pretty hopeful after romancing Mr. Bridgerton because I like actually genuinely enjoyed that one. Then we get to to Sir Philip and I don't know I've analyzed a couple different things that I might just really not vibe with in terms of Julia Quinn's writing. Number one thing is the like alpha male and also just all the men have serious anger issues that they need to work through. Like all of these guys need to go to therapy. They all have things that they need to work through. And I just don't like, I don't need to read eight books about angry men. I just don't think that's necessary. I feel like there is a way that this one could develop where Sir Philip like learns and he like grows and I feel like there could be some really great character development so I am still ho holding out hope however based on past experiences of the uh, last four books that I've read I'm not holding out too much hope I do love Eloise and I love her relationship with T Sir Philip's children I think that's really lovely and I am really enjoying those moments of the story I really enjoy Eloise's character. I feel like her character is really interesting in terms of like what she wants in life and what she's like looking for in a partner and how like she's very much like looking for a partner because like she's lonely and like that's like kind of about like it's a valid thing where she's like I don't know I my best friend just got married I'm like sweating in my car right now. I really am liking her like motivations for certain things. Um yeah, I feel like there is potential in this one for growth, and I'm really hoping that we get to see it. I'll let you know if it gets better by the end, because I don't know if I can read any more of these books, if it's all just going to be all about, like, angry men. Like, if I needed that, I would just go on the internet. Like, I don't need that in my books. Okay, we are on the ground. That is the vibe for this clip. So I finished To Sir Philip with love and I wish I could say that I enjoyed this book. I wish I could say I had any like particular feelings towards this book. After the halfway point it just got so incredibly boring. The most interesting part didn't even really involve Eloise and Philip. It actually involved Benedict and Sophie. So if that tells you anything, there you go. In the end, all the characters end up being exactly the same. From Antony to Benedict to Philip to Colin. Mm, Colin's a little bit different. Um, and Benedict also is a little bit different. But for the most part, they all end up having the same personality traits. And even Simon a little bit. One is that they obviously are no good at processing emotion, so it just translates to anger. All of them are so angry all the time. And of course, who do they take it out on? The women in their lives. At this point, the most like dynamic 
relationship to evolve is probably Antony and Kate, which is ironic considering my like deep level of hatred towards Antony at the beginning of all this. Yeah, so Sir Philip has anger issues as all the men in these series. He also just doesn't seem to have, I don't like, he, he doesn't have any chemistry with Eloise. There's like a physical attraction there. There is a big emphasis on the physical attraction there. But other than that, nothing. And literally it got to the point where it was like Eloise was like, she's falling in love with him. She realizes she loves him. And I'm like, why? For what? For what reason do you love this man? Like genuine question. What has he done to for you? besides be good in bed, I guess. So yeah, because of this like lack of chemistry, lack of communication, of course, all of these are like heavily relying on like miscommunication and just terrible communication skills. I don't want to finish the books. I might try and start the next one. I don't even remember what that one's called. I think it's Francesca's story. I am kind of interested because hers might be a little bit different because she's a widow at this point, which is sad. I will let you guys know when I start that one. <laughs> Catch me reading these books on three times speed because I just, I can't, I can't do it. I am checking in to say that I did decide to start book number six. I'll listen to like a solid 25% just to get a feel of the characters and everything and then make my decision. I am already kind of liking this. It is a little bit different. So this one follows Francesca and Francesca actually was widowed. So she has already been married. She was widowed at the age of 22. Um, and so this is following her and the cousin of her husband. And they were all like really good friends. They basically grew up like brothers. So they're, they're all really good friends. And the cousin, I think his name is Michael. Oh my God. I'm so bad with names. Michael, he was like into Francesca, but he like felt guilty about it because obviously it's his cousin's wife and the like, he, he is a notorious rake, of course. Yeah. So we'll see how this one goes. I am liking that they do already have like a pre-established relationship. Uh, Francesca and Michael, I feel like that is gonna add a little bit something different to the dynamic. I'm gonna try and get like 25% of the way into this one, see how I feel. If I'm liking it, maybe I'll continue. Hi, so I am about 50% of the way through When He Was Wicked, and I'm actually kind of liking it, which is surprising considering how bored I was with the last book. So first of all, there is that established relationship between Michael and Francesca, and I feel like something about the established relationship adds so much more chemistry to the characters and their relationship because I also felt this way about Penelope and Colin where their relationship just felt slightly stronger than all of the other ones and I just felt like there was more chemistry to them. Michael definitely has his faults. I will say that he is another one where he just has like anger issues and probably needs to go to a therapist as all of these male characters do, apparently. Francesca is a fun character because she is definitely a little more feisty and because she doesn't have that like extra layer of like being um, unmarried where she she's a widow, so she's been married before, she's gone through all this before. I feel like they're, I don't know, she's a bit freer than a lot of the other girls in these series. I'm interested to see where this goes because I can see it being very different than the other ones, but I can also see it falling into some similar traps that the past books have. So I'm actually down to continue with this, which is shocking. I'll let you know how I feel at the end, but I might actually enjoy this one. I don't know. I forgot to say one thing that has been a little bit weird about this one is I am <laughs> very confused about the timeline. There's definitely been some timeline issues with this book because this one and Romancing Mr. Bridgerton technically happens simultaneously, at least so far. I don't know if there may be a time jump at some point in this book, but as of right now, this one actually happens at basically the same time as Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, but it's missing some important aspects, specifically um, Lady Whistledown isn't happening, and it should be, so I'm confused, and it just makes me think that 
Julia Quinn didn't plan this one out at all. There's just, there's a lot of inconsistencies in so many of these books where I'm like, wait, but, but that hasn't happened yet. So I don't know. It's weird. Okay. So last night I managed to finish When He Was Wicked and I liked it. I know. I am just as shocked as all of you. I was like, ready to DNF the rest of the series. I was ready to just be like, you know what, I'll re listen to like the first couple chapters just to get a feel of it and I'll probably be done. This one was probably my favorite of all of the books. So what worked in this one's favor? First of all, I loved that Francesca and Michael had a previous relationship. So the fact that they had a connection already just helped so much with the chemistry. You could say that with To Sir Philip with love or whatever it's called, that Eloise and Sir Philip actually had a like kind of a relationship because they had been writing to each other for a year. But it's made very clear that Philip Sir Philip is very different than how he presented himself in the letters, which again should have just been a red flag or something like it just did not work because Michael and Francesca had like a mutual respect for each other already established it just made it so much better I will say Michael still had his problems still was way too possessive just the whole like and this happens in every single one of the books where there's a moment where the guy is just like, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. And it just, something about the way that it's written is so uncomfortable. However, like, I cannot deny that they actually had chemistry, which was something that most of the other books were missing. And I felt like they did actually respect each other for the most part. I still will say, like, this isn't like, a great work of historical romance. Like, I've read other historical romances that are just so much better. It did draw me into the story and it did leave me, like, with enough excitement for the characters that I've already started the next book, It's in His Kiss. So like I said, I've already started this book and I am already halfway through. I know, terrible at updating. Who's surprised? It's in His Kiss follows Hyacinth, which is the youngest Bridgerton. So there is a little bit of a jump. We don't quite see Gregory yet. I believe he is the last one. So it follows her and Gareth St. Clair, who is the grandson of Lady Danbury, aka my favorite character in both the books and the TV show. Lady Danbury is the kind of character that will like call you out. She, uh, I just love old lady characters. <laughs> anyway, so Gareth St. Clair is Lady Danbury's grand son. His older brother recently passed away, which of course leaves him as the inheritant of the estate, so something similar to the last book <laughs> for sure. However, he is hiding a secret of his past. And then we have Hyacinth, who is actually pretty close to Lady Danbury. She goes over every Tuesday and reads to her, and she is like the most outspoken of the Bridgerton girls because of course she's the youngest, so in order to be heard in her family, she just has to be outspoken. She's like highly intelligent. Yeah, she definitely reminds me of Kate from the second book, The Viscount Who Loved Me. So again, the things that I am enjoying about this so far is the fact that Gareth and Hyacinth do actually have a previous relationship. They like know each other. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily friends, but they know each other, they're comfortable in each other's presence because they both have that relationship with Lady Danbury. It is a little weird reading about Hyacinth just because in so many of the previous books she was so young. Like when we start The Duke and I, I think she's only like eight years old. Now she's 22, but it is a little bit weird, <laughs> especially having like binged all these books. I'm like, wow, last week she was eight, now she's 22 and making out with this guy. Overall though, I am enjoying it. Gareth, again, does have his problems. All of the men just have anger issues. They're all just, there needs to be a better way for Julia Quinn to write these guys dealing with their anger because they are just too aggressive. I have also come across like a couple problems with this one that happened also in the previous one where the male, so in this one Gareth and the last one Michael, the guys are like basically trying to trap the women into marriage. And while things are like consensual, it's definitely coursed 
consent. It's not like enthusiastic consent, which is not real consent. I will say so far, Gareth has definitely been the one of the more respectful guys. So there is that. And I am sensing so much more chemistry. All right. I just finished In His Kiss, <laughs> the seventh Bridgerton book, and I am shocked. I am genuinely shocked right now because I enjoyed it. I don't know if my expectations were just that low from all the previous books or if I actually liked this book and it was actually good, but like I had a good time. First of all, there was actual chemistry between um, Hyacinth and Gareth. Yeah, there was like actual chemistry, actual like friendship in their relationship, which was so nice to see. I actually believe that they were in love. And the problem with so many of these past ones was I just, I didn't believe that they actually liked each other. <laughs> I am surprised. I am very surprised right now. Gareth did have his problems. He definitely very problematic at times. Like he was not a perfect hero. And again, it goes back to the thing where like for some reason they think that he wants to have like a fast marriage or whatever. And so his solution is, ah, yes, I'm just gonna have sex with her. And then she has to marry me right away. Um, it was slightly more consensual than past ones. That is for sure. I really loved Hyacinth as a character too. I just think that she's so smart and that she doesn't immediately turn to like mush when she like gets in the relationship with the guy because so many of the other characters even though they are like smart and strong as soon as they do start to like the guy suddenly it's like they lose all of their strength and it's like where did their personality go but but for Hyacinth she like didn't she still like had her like inquisitive mind and it was so nice to see this one has been my favorite so far and I'm actually oh gosh I really hope this last book doesn't disappoint me I am going to be starting our final book which is called it's called something on the way to the wedding so that is our final one and it is centered around Gregory, our final Bridgerton. So I am about halfway through on the way to the wedding, our last and final Bridgerton book, and I'm not having a bad time. Like, it's not bad. I wouldn't say it's particularly good. It's a pretty cliche plot. It's a very like romantic comedy. Everyone's kind of in love with the wrong person type deal. I wouldn't say it's like particularly executed, well, like it's, it's very cliche. So this is our final Bridgerton book. It follows Gregory. So the youngest son, second youngest in the family. And it follows Lady Lucinda. She is engaged to be married and um, she is always been like, the best friend to the pretty girl. <laughs> so Gregory thinks he's in love with uh, my favorite character's name, Hermione Watson. It just makes me laugh because it's like Emma Watson who plays Hermione Granger. Anyway, Gregory has a thing for Hermione Watson and Lucy's like, yeah, I'll whatever. I'll help you try and get my best friend because she's in love with this different guy who is not right for her. And then just hijinks ensues because of course then Lucy develops feelings and yeah. Um, so we're about halfway through and I wouldn't say there's like an intense amount of chemistry. I think it's cute. I, it's not, again, it's not particularly swoon worthy, but like I'm not having a bad time and Gregory hasn't been terrible, <laughs> which honestly in these is all I can ask for. I have officially finished all of the Bridgerton books. I actually really enjoyed On the Way to the Wedding. Was it particularly well written? No, but I will say there was chemistry between the couple. I felt like there was actual like respect and love between the two of them. It was the least spicy of all the books. Like honestly, I think there was only like one spicy scene in there. And well, I don't mind steamy scenes. Like if they're well written, I can enjoy them in books. The problem has been in all the past books is I just haven't really felt like the respect and the connection between a lot of the couples 
for me to enjoy them. So while this one only had like one steamy scene, it was okay. <laughs> it actually did get kind of exciting towards the end there. There was um, some unexpected things that happened that like definitely kept me at the edge of my seat. I was ready to go. I was like, all right, let's hear what's going to happen. How is this all going to work itself out? And it was a good time. So there we go. I honestly, character development for Julia Quinn. Her books did end up getting better with time, which thank god. So let's talk about how I would rank these books. So still down there at number eight is The Duke and I. Unfortunately, while I did enjoy the first half of the book, in fact it was well on its way to be like a four-star book for me, the second half just completely ruined it for me. The couple lost their chemistry. There was, I mean, it wasn't even just dubious consent. Like, it was basically rape. And after all that, like, I just could not enjoy even like the cute moments between the couples. Number seven is To Sir Philip With Love. First of all, this book was just freaking boring, which was unfortunate because Eloise up until then was probably one of my favorite characters, or at least one of my favorite Bridgertons. When I say there was no chemistry between the couple for the entire book, there was no chemistry. Everything was like purely physical and <laughs> It got so repetitive. I felt like there was no respect between Sir Philip and Eloise. And it just, it was not a good time to read. I literally was almost about to DNF the entire series after that book. Number six is The Viscount Who Loved Me. Now, I might be a bit biased because I just <laughs> can't stand Antony. Him being like the head of the household, him having that like whole alpha male mentality just really put a sour note on everything for me. However, I did feel like there was actually decent character development for him, and I did really love Kate. So while I didn't love it and I didn't love the way that Antony treated Kate for a large majority of the book, by the end I was buying the romance and I did feel like they had come to form a connection. Number five is An Offer from a Gentleman. I loved Benedict. I genuinely did love him until about halfway through the book. Again, once you hit that halfway point, it's make or break for these books. Unfortunately, there were one too many problematic things that happened in there for me, and I, again, couldn't fully enjoy the relationship between the couple because I just didn't feel like there was that, first of all, equal power in the relationship, and again, I felt like there wasn't that equal respect. However, <laughs> that ball scene at the beginning, I, like, I was swooning. It was so romantic, <laughs> and I really hope that they do find a way to make it, like, better for the TV series, because I would love to see that beautiful scene. Number four is Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. Honestly, I would say that An Offer from a Gentleman and Romancing Mr. Bridgerton are kind of on equal ground. Again, Colin, he had a bit of a temper and that did not sit well for me um, because it did result in some scenes where I'm like, mm, maybe you can just like calm down just a little bit, my dude. However, I felt like there was a lot more equal footing between him and Penelope and it resulted in a lot more chemistry between the couple. Number three is When He Was Wicked. As I mentioned previously when I first read it, what I really enjoyed about this one was the fact that our two love interests knew each other and they had this connection before the book started. Because of that, their relationship was just so much stronger. They were so much more comfortable with each other and it really showed throughout the book. I couldn't put this one higher because again, some uncomfy scenes that I just did not sit well with me. Number two and number one, I'm feeling like I, I definitely have gone back and forth between the two of them, but I think I am going to have to put On the Way to the Wedding as number two, only because there was a lot of like inner dialogue and you didn't see as much of like actual interaction between the couple. I thought they definitely had the best relationship of any of the couples 
for sure. However, it did drag quite a bit especially towards the beginning and the the pacing just wasn't there which of course leaves it's in his kiss as number one while i did have some problems with our love interest gareth sinclair he definitely made some <laughs> questionable choices they weren't terrible like honestly they were definitely things that like didn't like break him as a character and, and he also had some really great development through the book. Again, our main couple, Hyacinth and Gareth, they knew each other before the book started. It left them in so much more of a comfortable relationship. And it, again, just showed on page, which made the book overall the most enjoyable. Okay, there we go. I have officially finished all the Bridgerton books. So would I recommend reading these books? Honestly, no. Just wait and watch the TV show. <laughs> I personally don't think they're particularly worth it. They are fast, they are quick to get through, but there's much better historical romances out there. Well, thank you for watching this reading vlog. I know it was a bit of a wild ride. I honestly appreciate y'all sticking with me. Have you read the Bridgerton books? If you have, let me know your thoughts down below. I'm genuinely curious to see what other people's opinions are of these books. And don't be afraid to disagree with me. I am down to have a little bit of discourse down in the comments. Uh, just be respectful. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more videos like this, be sure to hit subscribe. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And until next time, bye!